Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and students. I am Avi Mukherjee. I am the Dean of the College of Business at Clayton State University. Thank you for coming to the Spring 2016 Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series. As you know, every semester, we bring one CEO-level speaker to our College of Business in the Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series. Some of the renowned speakers in this series have been people like E. Jenner Wood, Chairman, President, and CEO of SunTrust Bank Atlanta Division, Ed Baker, publisher of the Atlanta Business Chronicle, and Tom Darrow, Chair of the Society for Human Resource Management Foundation Board. This event is sponsored in part by the SunTrust Foundation. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce our Spring 2016 distinguished speaker, Mr. Matt Friedman, founder and CEO of WingZone. A true entrepreneur, Mr. Friedman has a great and interesting story to tell about his ideas, his work, and his vision that has made his company a runaway success. WingZone is one of the nation's fastest growing takeout delivery chains which developed from a single storefront in Gainesville, Florida, to a restaurant chain with more than 100 locations in 21 states and eight international countries. Mr. Friedman and his friend perfected the recipes that have become Wing Zone's trademark flavors in their fraternity house kitchen while he was doing his Bachelor of Business Administration degree at the University of Florida. The Wing Zone concept, providing a fun and mouth-watering alternative to pizza delivery, was an immediate success in Gainesville that eventually spread throughout the country and even abroad. Wing Zone has been recognized as one of the industry's fastest growing franchise concepts. By numerous business publications, the Food Network, ESPN, CNBC, and Fox Business News, have featured this company. In addition, WingZone made the Inc. magazine's list of 500 fastest growing US private companies and has been recognized in several other networks, for example, in the Food Network's Roker on the Road, ESPN's Cold Pizza, and has been included in Entrepreneur Magazine's Franchise 500 and Franchise Times Fast 55. I'm sure you will remember to get your wings for athletic events only from Wing Zone. I would also like to add that this event nicely coincides with the College of Business's recent strategic focus on entrepreneurship and innovation that has resulted in the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, a minor in entrepreneurship that is open to students from across the campus, a concentration in entrepreneurship and innovation that is open to management majors within the College of Business, and a vibrant student club. The College of Business also hosts two elevated pitch competitions on our campus every year. Please join me in welcoming tonight's distinguished speaker, Mr. Matt Friedman. Well, I think you said it all, so I just want to say thank you and have a great night. <laughs> now, we're going to have some fun tonight. I promise to keep this lively, upbeat, my number one goal tonight is to inspire and motivate you and just tell you my story. Um, I think it's best to start at the beginning because I was so much like so many of you uh, in a passion for entrepreneurship and leadership and kind of a vision for what I wanted to do with my life. So I'll take you way back and I'll tell you a little bit about the history of Wing Zone. So I was a kid that was born and raised in Long Island, New York. Any New Yorkers out there? All right, well, we love the South, and now I'm a Southerner, so. But it was a great place to grow up, and every Christmas and summer, uh, we'd go visit my uh, family um, up in Buffalo, New York. And for those of you that don't know it, Buffalo Wings were created, or the term came because it came from Buffalo, New York, not because it came off of Buffalo or any some crazy idea. So um, I was born in 1971, so you can do the math. I'm 44 right now. And uh, just to kind of give you a little chronological order of my life, 
I started to go upstate New York in the late 70s and early 80s, and I can tell you this, that the only place in the world that you could get buffalo wings back then were in upstate New York. So as a kid growing up, I loved these things. It was my favorite food in the world. I graduated high school, and I told my parents that I wanted to go somewhere different, somewhere warmer, somewhere um, just wanted to get out of New York and experience a different, part, a different part of the country. So I applied to the University of Florida. I had never visited there. Uh, luckily, I got in. My parents put me on a plane and said, good luck and don't get in trouble. <laughs> Which I did, but that's a different subject. So um, I get to the University of Florida, and I'm amazed as to kind of the, the food options that are there. And, and I lived in a dormitory, and I could call uh, the local sub place, and the, even back then there was sushi and pizza and Chinese food, and even the local Baskin Robbins would deliver an ice cream sundae to your dorm room. But all I really wanted were wings, and ultimately there were none on campus. In fact, there were none even in town. This is 1989. So after a somewhat uneventful first couple years of college, I was doing well in school, I knew that I wanted to be a business uh, major. Um, a lot of people will ask me about, you know, obviously I started a restaurant concept, but to me I was starting a business. And was it in family? Was it in friends? Uh, my mom was a teacher. My dad was a real estate broker. Um, none of my grandparents were entrepreneurs. No one had owned restaurants. So I think that uh, you don't need to have a family or a heritage of entrepreneurship. It's either in you or it's not in you. And for me, it was in me. So after my second year of college, I went home to New York for the summer and worked. And my dad asked me what I wanted to do. And you know, he said, you, know, you got to start thinking about kind of your post-college career. It was in my last couple years. And I said, Dad, I, I know this sounds crazy, but I want to open a wing place. And so he said, uh, not probably my first choice of your career choice, but you know, he was very supportive of it and said, the one thing I will tell you is that I really think that you need to create a business plan. And I know a lot of your professors may say, you got to create a business plan. And I will tell you this, that I think it's important, but I think simplicity is very important. I live by a motto of simplify and decide. You simplify decisions and you make decisions. So on one piece of paper, I created what at the time was my vision of what Wing Zone would become. And I'm here to tell you that 23 years later, it's not much different. Uh, on that piece of paper, uh, we were going to focus on a core item that was authentic buffalo wings. And for those of you who don't know the definition of an authentic buffalo wing, it's a deep fried wing, non-breaded, crispy on the outside, juicy on the inside, and coated in some sort of unique flavor. At that time, it was mainly buffalo flavors, served with blue cheese or ranch dressing and celery sticks. And so I knew that that was the core of what we wanted. We wanted to have best in class products. To me, I was always someone that was passionate about flavor or different sauces. So I wanted a large variety of different flavors. And at that time, we had created seven flavors, which was unheard of because back then it was kind of either mild or hot or maybe there was a barbecue. But coming up with some unique, innovative ones that you'll see in my presentation were, were very unique. Um, the other thing was we, I understood our audience. You know, I was a college student. I knew the demands of that customer base. So our entire model was we were going to open a college market, and if somehow we were successful there, we would duplicate it in another college market somewhere in another city, in another state, and that sort of thing. And then the last thing was that uh, we were very focused on a core part of our business, and that was dinner and late night. So one of the things that was important to us back then is we really concentrated on being that dinner option for students and that late night option. So our hours of operation when we first started were we opened at 6 p.m. and we were open until 2 a.m. So here, a simple business plan. 
I get back to school that fall and I start to share with some of my closest friends, fraternity brothers and people I had met about this vision I had for a business. And, you know, you kind of meet, you kind of get a sense as to who your true friends are when you start to share about your personal goals and, and a lot of what you want. And, you know, some people were very negative about it. You know, that will never work. And why would you do that? Um, and I think you got to have a strong inner soul, so to speak, to say, well, this is what I'm passionate about. And I would love your feedback, but I'm not going to really deal with negativity as far as the idea of it not happening. So I started to go friend by friend about, you know, would this be something you would be interested in and maybe doing with me? Or, you know, what are your thoughts about it? And one of the few people that I talked to uh, was a good friend of mine. We were fraternity brothers, and his name is Adam Scott. So um, to kind of expedite the story a little bit, Adam is one of my best friends, and he's been my business partner for over 23 years. So a lot of things will come up when you look at starting a business or an idea of, do partnerships work? Am I better off doing it by myself? I will tell you, I can only talk for myself, and a partnership has been one of the best decisions that I have made. Now, one of the things I will tell you is that Adam and I are very different. Our skill sets are different, our personalities are different, but we're both very passionate about the business, and we both share in responsibilities and workload. So I think one of the things that's important as you look at maybe starting a business or creating something is it doesn't have to be a friend, but it has to be someone that can offer a different skill set. You know, my main focus is really on the operations side. So I'm very much into uh, running our operations team, making sure we run great restaurants, that we're selling to the right people. Adam is really more on the financial side. He's a whiz. He's, a, he's an awesome CFO. He, his, his technology knowledge is great. He loves working with our accountants and attorneys, things that I want no part of. So ultimately, it was a great bond. But one of the most important things I asked Adam in 1991 when I first approached him on this, I said, Adam, I have an important question for you. I said, how much money do you have to invest in this business? And he said, Matt, I have none. <laughs> I said, well, that's perfect because I have none either. So here we are, two guys with an idea with not a penny to our name. So we did what most young people would do is we kind of started to put together a more detailed business plan and figured out how much money we needed to raise. And we, we walked into, I would say, no less than 12 banks. And we said, we'd like to apply for a loan. I said, okay, well, sit down. Tell us about what you want. Um, can you please fill out this financial statement? And it was just filled with zeros. And there was no ones in front of it. It was just zeros. So. Just an awesome learning experience. We really were naive. We, were, we really had no idea what we were doing. But it was a cool experience for us to kind of understand um, what it took to kind of get a loan. You know, some of the bankers probably laughed and some were very nice to us saying, let me explain a little bit to you guys. I know you're young, you're in school. Um, Adam and I were both finance majors, but obviously the University of Florida wasn't teaching us much about bank loans at that point. <laughs> so, um, a lot of them said, listen, you've got to have some assets, you've got to have some liquidity, you've got to have some net worth, no lender's just going to give you money. So I said, wow, okay, well. And then I said, well, as most entrepreneurs would say, I said, well, if I had the money, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> okay, so then we said, okay, back to the drawing board. We, we just can't do this. You know, neither of us came from uh, very affluent families. I mean, typical middle class stuff, but it wasn't like mom and dad were going to kind of lend us the money, especially because we were in school. So I said to Adam one day, I said, Adam, you know, we live in this fraternity house. You know, it houses 60 fraternity brothers. Uh, it has a full kitchen in there uh, with walk-in coolers and sinks and deep fryers and a grill. And I said, do you know what happens at 7 o'clock every night? He said, no. I said, at 7 o'clock, the lights are turned off, the door is locked, and it does not open until the next morning. I said, Adam, we have our test kitchen right here. This is perfect for us because you're never going to be able to sell them on this. 
No way, shape, or form. And I will tell you that I'm a great salesperson. It's what I do. It's one of my passions, okay? Because you're always going to have to sell yourself. You're going to have to sell a product. You're going to have to sell a franchise. But you got to believe it. And no one was going to stand in my way of testing this. So I went to the fraternity president. I said, listen, here's really, I'm going to shoot, shoot straight with you. This is a passion of ours. This is what I need. I really need some help here. And ultimately, he bought into it and said, OK. So here we were, two guys with a concept, no experience, um, with a location now fully equipped, but still we didn't have enough money. So somehow Adam and I uh, took $250 each off a credit card we had. So with $500, we went to Sam's Club, bought some frozen Tyson chicken wings, some white styrofoam boxes, some tin foil, some bags, some french fries, some Coca-Cola, and some different ingredients to make our famous sauces as we claimed. Um, and we had a telephone line installed in the fraternity house, and this is back before the internet, before online ordering and things like that, and it rang. If you dialed 377-BIRD, because wing was taken, it rang 2473, and it would ring in the fraternity house kitchen. And it was a crazy idea. So we had these simple menus printed, and we only sold three things, Coca-Cola, French fries and wings. We didn't sell Diet Coke or Sprite, just Coca-Cola, okay? <laughs> and we had seven different flavors. So we had print material, we had a location, we had product, and we had a telephone number. One of the best stories I love to tell people is, people say, well, didn't people know where you were? And it's funny as you understand your customer mix. Um, on the bottom of the menu, it said, call for delivery 377 Bird. No address, nothing like that. And you know, to a lot of college students, they didn't really care. They didn't care where you were. They just knew that they could call and they could get some great food, okay? So we did get the occasional call of, where are you guys located? Or can we come in and eat there? And I was famous for some crazy lines, but I would, I would say things like, oh, we're right near campus, or uh, our, our dining room's being remodeled right now, so it's, it's delivery only. So Adam and I started in our fraternity house kitchen. We went around campus handing out flyers. Um, uh, people were very intrigued by it. You know, oh, wing place, this is great, I can order, it's delivery, and and all this sort of thing. We were so excited. So we get back to the fraternity house. Uh, it's 7 p.m. and the phone just starts ringing. And we're like, this is great. You know, we're cooking up wings. Uh, our fraternity, some of our fraternity brothers were delivering them around campus. And we kind of just stumbled into this. And so a lot of people say, well, how do you take it from just concept to the next level? And I will tell you that it takes some good fortune. It takes some good luck. It takes a tremendous amount of hard work. Um, I, I really believe that we were so resourceful in how we started it that we've kept that kind of culture in our company as we've grown. Um, there's really three phases in the history of our business. And who knows what the fourth one will be. Number one was starting that first store. And I'll take you through a little bit more of the history of the company, how we went from the fraternity house to our first real location in Gainesville, Florida to building six more company-owned restaurants in a four-year time period, to starting our franchise program in 2000 and opening and starting our international global division in 2010. I think one of the things that is unique about our company is we're completely privately held. So Adam and I are the two 50-50 owners. Um, we have no debt. We have conservative growth plans. But I would say the most important thing about our company is that uh, today we are as passionate about our business as we've ever been from that first storefront. And I think people ask me all the time about uh, an exit strategy of going public or selling to a venture capitalist or being acquired by a larger franchise or restaurant system. 
And I say the same thing. I said, when the passion's gone, it is time to get out. So there's nothing wrong with starting a business for the sole purpose to grow it and sell it. That was never my intention. My intention was to build something special that we could own, that we could grow, that maybe we hand off to our family someday or not. So I'll take you through a little bit more of the history of the company and, and kind of my experiences of being an entrepreneur. I talked a little bit about our partnership. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's been a great experience to have a partner that you can count on. There are going to be some rough days. There were days when we didn't know if we could make payroll or we didn't know if we could pay the food bill or the light bill. And sometimes it's great just to bitch to a friend of yours who happens to be your partner. If you happen to be married or have a significant other, sometimes it's not the best idea to bring all that home, okay? It's good sometimes to turn it off. So my wife likes to say that you spend more time with your business partner than with me, and that's probably pretty factual. But when I come home, I do try to turn work off and not kind of uh, let it run my life, so to speak. So a little bit of recap here as far as our growth and things like that. So we started in 1993 in Gainesville, Florida. I'll tell a quick story about how we actually went from the fraternity house to our first storefront in Gainesville, Florida. Because building a restaurant was a pretty substantial investment at that time. Um, in 1993, I was a senior in college and Adam was a junior. Uh, we had started the business a year prior, so while we were still in school. And we saw this immediate success being in the fraternity house. But what we realized is that was not a viable location for us to be able to expand and really grow this model. So we actually tried to get some loans. This is post-fraternity house as we kind of looked at the growth and opening a real storefront. And unfortunately, there were really dead ends everywhere. And so Adam and myself went on a quest of trying to find an investor that would invest in us. That ultimately led in a dead end as well. And we went to sometimes the best people to go to. And I know a lot of you in the audience have some great ideas and you're looking at investors or lenders or things online and sometimes you just got to go to people that really can count on you the most or that you believe in and that's family. It's okay to ask your family for support or a good friend or someone that's known you for a long time. And I went to my parents and Adam went to his parents. And we asked if we could borrow $15,000 each from them. And this is 1993. It was a lot of money. Trust me. It's still a lot of money. And some way, shape, or form, they had enough belief in us that they lent us that money. But there was a couple stipulations. Number one, it was a loan. This was not a gift. This was going to be paid back. Okay? Number two, you must stay in school. And number three, you must graduate. And so here we were, a couple guys that had started a kind of a, a restaurant concept. We built our first storefront in Gainesville, Florida. Our rent was $700 a month in this location. It was 1,200 square feet, but it was ours. Within six months of being in this business, and we were there morning, noon, and night, even though we were still in school, somehow we had enough going on that we were able to kind of go to class, study, and work, and make it happen. I know a lot of you today are doing other things other than just school, and I respect that tremendously. You're working, you're having to pay the bills, you know, and, you're, and you've made a commitment to staying in school to get your degree and learn from some of your really impressive professors that I've had a chance to meet tonight. So within six months of operating, we had paid back our loan, I had graduated, Adam still had one more semester, and so all of a sudden now it was ours to take off to the next level. And from 1993 to 1999, we opened six new company-owned restaurants with the same business model, major college markets, evening delivery, a focused product, <clears throat> and it was really a glamorous, glorious time for us. I will say this though, 
Being an entrepreneur and starting a business when your life is simple was easier. There was no spouse, there were no kids, there was no mortgage. It was a very simple life. I lived in a very simple apartment with another guy. Our rent was like $175 a month each. So it was a very simple life because I knew that I had to live lean in order to make this business a success. So in 1999, we had seven company-owned restaurants. Uh, we weren't a franchise. No one had really taught us a little bit about what the business was about. We just learned. And so I think that that was a really special experience for us. We had people coming to us and wanting to learn about franchising. How can I open one of these in my market, in my city, in my town? And to be honest with you, we knew nothing about franchising. We knew nothing about the business model, how it worked, the revenue structure, but no different than starting the restaurant. We learned, we read, we researched, we met people. A lot of people want to just be given the information. And I will tell you that there's something to be said about going and getting the information. You know, I have restaurant managers of mine that say, this piece of equipment's broken, okay? Have you tried to go online to read about how to fix it? Of course not. We'll try that. So there's things called being resourceful and trying to figure out solutions and things like that. So when franchising came about, we went into it and said, okay, how can we become a great franchise company? What is it about? And in 1999, we sold our first franchise in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And probably one of the best things that ever happened to us was it, be, it quickly became the number one store in our chain out of eight stores. It was grossing over a million dollars a year in revenue in 1,500 square feet, and it was an instant success. So that pioneered the next chapter of our business, the franchising of it. And what does it mean to become a great franchisor? Um, there's a lot of different ways for you to grow a business. There's licensing, there's internal growth, there's taking it in a di different direction. I think WingZone has, we've been very entrepreneurial. Some people, when we went into Panama in 2010 with our first international location, people thought we were crazy. We have nine stores in Panama right now, and we are in a formidable chain in that country. So let me take you through a little bit about franchising before I get into some other core of this program. Just to be conscious of time, I know we have to finish up 7.15 with Q&A. You got it, I'll be quick. So franchising. I think one of the things that we've learned, or I learned very quickly, was there are four key components. Number one is you have to have a proven profitable model. A lot of people say, well, I want to franchise this concept. How many of them do you have? I have none. Will not work. You have to prove it. And for us, we had proven it seven times. Yes, you have to be profitable. You know, it's one of the most important things in business, okay? I know it's given. It, it, it's kind of a given statement. But profitability drives growth. And there's nothing wrong with profitability. In fact, in our core values as a company, profitability is one of our core values. And there's nothing wrong with that from a business philosophy. Scalability. From a franchising model, if it can only work in one particular city, in one particular state, it's not a franchise model. For us, we knew that we could open wing zones in every college market all over the United States. And for those of you that don't know it, the Domino's pizza model was almost identical. Started in Ypsilanti, Michigan, in a small college market, and the first 20 stores they opened were in major college markets in Ohio and Michigan. Number three was established systems. You've got to have systems in place to be able to duplicate this over and over again. You know, one of the things that franchising is, is a system. And you can look at where you go on a daily basis, whether it's a McDonald's or a Subway or a Dunkin' Donuts or, you know, a Jiffy Lube. And part of it is, is you want the same experience, the same product. 
may not be the best product, but it's the most consistent. And consistency is one of the keys to business. You are better off being consistently average than one time great and one time bad. Because you will never retain customers with inconsistency. And then the last phase of franchising, which was important to us, was the ability to teach it to someone in a short amount of time. At that point, we had a 10-day training program. We had a simple menu. It was like, this is how you do it. This is where you buy it from, and just go. So I think it's important from that side. For us, franchising has been a way, and without saying this in a negative way or a greedy way, we've been able to grow the wing zone concept through franchising. The value of our company is exponentially different today because we started franchising. There's over 100 locations opened, mostly driven by franchise growth, and a lot of that was with franchise capital. See, when we go sell a franchise or we open a new country, that particular individual is the one funding that growth. So for us, it was a very strong economic model in part of what it is. The other thing, and two last things about franchise, is it is relationship focused. People need to trust you. They need to believe you. They need to feel that you genuinely have their back. And at the end of the day, if your franchisees are successful and profitable, you've got a growth model. So, we talked about some of those things. We talked about our business model. Even today, I love simple models. If I was to recommend to any of you, when you're starting a business, a brick and mortar bakery, or some sort of app, or whatever the case may be, stick to simplicity. Stick to something that you know. You know, for me, I knew wings, or I knew I was passionate about it. Even today, our menu is simple. Yeah, we've expanded the menu, but even today, it is still a simple menu. We still focus on a delivery takeout model. We've added dining seats, and the stores have gotten a lot nicer. And what once cost $30,000 to build now costs $300,000 to build. But ultimately, the model is still the same. We still go into small footprints. We still know our target market and target customer. And so I think that that has been a key level of our success. Last thing I'll talk about is, is kind of what you're passionate about, what your brand or what your business represents. And for us, it's always been about flavor or sauces, as some refer it to. When we first opened the first location, we had seven different sauces. And that was so unique. Um, that we had a variety of things. And even to this day, it's what we pride ourselves on. You know, to talk about some of our flavors and what we do, you know, everyone has a unique name, everyone has a logo, everyone has a story behind it. And so that's something that's very special to us. You know, these are created by people that work for us and some of our customers and some of our franchisees and collaboration and stuff like that. Not every great idea is going to come from you. Okay? You know, there is something to be said in our office, and we've got 15 people that work out of our office, and there's some very talented people. But money is not made in that office. Money is made at the restaurant level. So when I come into our office and I see two people there, I like that. I don't want to see 15 people in an office because in our world, that's not where our business makes money. I'm going to show you two short videos here just to give you a sense as to kind of um, a little bit about the brand and what we've done. And I'll finish up with a few slides because I do want to make sure that we allow for some Q&A because I'm sure that we could have some interesting questions about our history, our growth, and maybe some of the challenges that I've experienced of growing a brand and ultimately um, growing a business. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in this is that I am the face of this company. And there's nothing wrong with that. You'll see in these videos that there's tremendous passion and belief in some of those things because that is what you are selling. And so every day, you know, it may not be you, but it could be someone within your company or a partner or something like that. You've got to be selling it. You've got to have good days. Hi, I'm Matt Freeman, CEO and founder of Windsor. Welcome to Windsor. 
Every successful franchise brand should own one core thing. At WinZone, we own flavor. Everything we do within the organization and with our brand is focused on flavor. Everyone says that their food is flavorful, but we take flavor to a whole new level. Flavor is at the core of our brand experience. Our focus on flavor began years ago when Adam and I spent our nights fine-tuning our recipe in our fraternity house kitchen. Today, our trademark flavors and flavor rubs are the result of over 20 years of research and development. And for that reason, our flavors have received national recognition. The National Buffalo Wing Festival has selected Buffalo Bliss as the official competition flavor several years from We've also received awards for our Hot Shot, Thai Chili, Tokyo Dragon, and Garlic Arm flavor. Our flavor and rubs are only half the story. The real magic takes place with our flavor-fused process. Just about everything on the Wing Zone menu can be fused with flavor, including burgers, chicken tenders, shrimp, chicken sandwiches, and boneless wings. Our customers mix and match to achieve flavor nirvana. When we say flavor is at the core of the Wing Zone brand, we really mean it. We call our most loyal customers flavor hauls. They adorn our walls and our advertising graphics. We celebrate our flavors on our menu system and even offer flavor fun on our Facebook page. But the proof of our flavor focus comes from our franchisees and our loyal customers. They are the true flavor models. All right. So I want to just uh, share with you the, the final phase of our growth and kind of what, what's in the next chapter for us from that side. So, you know, uh, one of the things that's important is to understand that there's going to be different levels of your uh, company as you look at, at things and, and expand and stuff like that. And so we made a decision in 2009 to really develop a, uh, an international program. Uh, we felt that, that uh, there's a whole world out there that it was not just confined to the United States, but there were opportunities out there. And we, we looked at this and said there were real opportunities to grow Wing Zone outside of the United States. Uh, and we had a targeted approach as to where we were going to grow and how much money it took. Even after being in business at that point for um, 16 years, uh, we embarked upon a global growth strategy. It took us four years from, from launching our international division to turn a profit. Uh, it took an investment of about $1.2 million from the time that we started our uh, international growth until we turned a profit. And right now we've got 23 operating stores internationally. Um, I think no different than the business plan that was created when we opened our first restaurant to the business plan that was created when we franchised was a business plan in going to become a global brand. So I think that uh, obviously the, the stakes have gone up, so to speak, over the years and the investments have gone up, but it's still core to what was established in 1991 in our fraternity house kitchen of the business plan, the model, and ultimately what it's about. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me every day, um, what is, what is the, the thing that I love most about uh, being in business for yourself and, um, and being an entrepreneur? And I will tell you that um, I love the pressure. I love the competition. And it's something that I thrive on. So um, in the course of a day as an entrepreneur or a business owner or CEO, you're going to make a lot of decisions. And remember what I said, what, what kind of our mantra is we, we simplify things and we decide. And we're not going to be right all the time. In fact, maybe we're, we're wrong a lot. But you make decisions, you stick to it, and you go. And I think that that has been probably one of the qualities of a leader that, um, that is necessary. I don't think you can ultimately, um, you know, think about things too long without making a decision. Um, I've got uh, a great team of people uh, at our headquarters, uh, people that are, have been with me a long time, and some very passionate people. Um, and I think that we treat 
them very fairly. I think we treat them with respect and we treat them as family. And so I've never had this true desire to become this massive company where I don't really know each individual franchise owner or people that work for me. And that's fine. You know, everyone thinks that just because, you know, it's about number of stores and, you know, why don't you have 500 stores or 1,000 stores? Maybe we'll get there. But ultimately, um, we look at success a little bit differently. Trust me, the company is very profitable and it has been a great experience. Um, and we'll take our growth one step at a time. Um, I'd like to open it up to some question and answer. We've got about, uh, well, about 10 minutes. And I'd love to, to answer some questions. And I'll even stick around if we have some time after. So let's have it right here. Okay. Yes. That's a great question. So the question re revolves around as we, we've gone to different international countries and different cultures. I'll just let you know we're in Panama, Honduras, and, uh, and Guatemala in Central America. We're in uh, Colombia and South America. We're in Singapore and Malaysia and Southeast Asia, and we just opened our first store in London. Uh, what we do, we do, we do believe heavily in customer research. We do um, a lot of uh, food testing. Um, before we go to a country to understand what their flavor or um, focus is. For example, in South America and Central America, they're very sweet driven. So not so much spice driven, but more on sweeter type of flavors and things like that. So we have 16 flavors in our lineup. It, when we go to a typical country, we'll go with eight to 10 that match them well. But the brand is very consistent. It's the same logo. It's still in English, even if it's in a country that speaks a different language. Uh, it's the same you know, packaging and a lot of those things. So it's very important that you don't change too much, but adapt to the local community. Yes, right here in the blue. Well, that's a great question. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So there, there, unfortunately, there's only four stores here in Atlanta. They're all our closest ones at Georgia Tech. We also have one in Marietta, Kennesaw, and Smyrna. And those are company-owned stores here in Atlanta. So I would love for you to come check us out. Uh, yes, right here. Well. It's a, it's a great question, and I, and I do believe that there are sacrifices that have to be made. I mean, I can't sit here and tell you that I haven't missed things with my kids and haven't been there for my wife and, and things like that. And there's a commitment that business owners make. Um, but it's passion, it's passionate for me, and it's, it's kind of, I get a high out of life a little bit on the work side. So you have to have family and partners and, and loved ones that ultimately understand that. Um, now, what was interesting is I met my wife after I had started the business. My kids obviously came after I had started the business, so they only know that. They only know that, hey, um, dad has something to do tonight and he's not here. Um, I, I do believe that hard work is a necessity for success. Um, but I do believe in a few other things. I am very good about taking vacations, meaning like I go away two or three times a year and I turn it off. And it's very important to do that. I believe firmly that I come back even more charged up. Taking some time off, decompress, and let's get back in it. So you got to have some understanding people behind you. Uh, yes, right there in the middle. Why did you choose wings? Well, two things. Number one is 
I loved the product, so I, I liked it as a consumer base, and I really looked at our particular market, which was a large college market of 40,000 students, and what was lacking in the market. So I really would encourage you, as you look at business ideas, look at it from a consumer's standpoint. I mean, some of the greatest ideas ever were created because you wanted something that wasn't available. So uh, we didn't really do anything that miraculous. We just created something that wasn't there. The other side of it is just to create, quote unquote, a better mousetrap, you know, meaning if there's something that's in the market that you think is underperforming or lacking or you can do it better, then go for that. Yes, right here in the front. No, it's a totally different model. Um, we, they've given credibility to the market with their IPO and their stock and stuff like that, but our entire niche is small footprint, takeout, um, and I think we're more about the food and they're more about the experience. So I think if I was to compare it, I'd compare it to, um, let's say, Burger King to smash burger or something like that you know that there's plenty of people in, the, in that field but everyone has their own niche yeah in the back over there yeah you know I, I think competition's an interesting thing to consider I, I you know Number one, you, you have to understand what your competitors are doing. You should shop them. I, I've been with franchisees that, that I'm like, let's go check out your competitors. Like, I'm not giving them the, the order. Is it? I'm like, trust me, the, the $15 you're going to spend there is not going to make or break their business. You need to know how their product is. Maybe you'll learn something. Um, but to answer your question specifically about that, you know, I think that um, because they're in the takeout delivery business, they are definitely a formidable competitor. They've got stronger marketing budgets. So for us, it's always been a product play of we have to have an exceptional product and be more authentic. Um, and that's kind of been our play. But, you know, we really do focus on our four walls and how our restaurants run and, and how clean they are and things like that. So we don't really get too overly involved in what, you know, the pizza guys are doing. So, you yeah, right over here? Yes. <laughs> That's an awesome question because, you know, a lot of people say, I want to buy a franchise. And it doesn't have to be a wing zone, it could be anything. It could be an H&R Block, or it could be a Jiffy Lube, or whatever. And there are a lot of franchise companies that have pressures, whether they're public companies or things like that, to continue to grow. And so they may accept certain people. You know, one of the cool things is that uh, we have the right to say no. And no different than someone may look at us and say it's not the right fit. So we bring people in for what's called a franchise day. We spend an entire day with them. Um, it's, it's more than just an interview. It's, it's really we get to, to get to know them a little bit. I mean, prior to that, we're running um, a, a credit report on them. We're running a background uh, check on them. We're seeing financials. We do uh, a disc personality analysis on people. Uh, we really want to understand who they are. We're looking for leaders. It is the most important thing we are looking for. I want leaders because I will tell you that this business is very competitive. And you got to be a competitive person to win in this segment. Um, you know, money is important, but there's a lot of people out there that have money but aren't leaders. And, you know, sometimes it may be that candidates aren't necessarily financially qualified. But we find other ways of doing it. There's manager partner programs, and we match them up with investors and other things like that. So you, you definitely, if you ever get into a point of that, if you sell to the wrong people, you can jeopardize your future. Yeah. All right. 
Oh, initial startup. So typically, let me just take you through a franchising side. This is a great question as far as uh, investments into franchising. T part of the advantage of looking at a franchise, and, and I will tell you that um, if you met someone that owned 30 Wendy's, are they an entrepreneur? You're damn right they're an entrepreneur. They've taken a, a, a concept and grown it to 30 stores. The advantage of franchising, whether you look at getting into your own or you know, building your own system that you franchise, is that there's a lot more lending opportunities out there. So for us, we put someone into business, they're gonna borrow about 20, minimum, of, uh, they're gonna put a cash injection of 20 to 30% of the overall investment. So let's just use a $300,000 investment. So they're gonna put up 60 to $90,000, which is a lot of money, and then we set them up with different lenders that are approved to lend on behalf of Wing Zone. So they're gonna borrow 210 to 240. So that's part of the advantage of franchising. There's some built-in networking of, uh, of financing uh, available there. And you know, one of the things that's very attractive if you can get loans out there is that interest rates are very low. When I first started in business and we took some of our first interest rates, I mean, we were paying 12, 13% interest rates, which was very normal back then. You know, now commercial loans are probably 6%, 7%, so it's very attractive. Yeah, in the back again. I mean, of course. I mean, you've got to have a certain amount of cash. You've got to have a certain credit score. I tell you, credit credit's very important out there. I mean, it, it, it's not an underestimated thing out there. You know, everyone gets kind of dinged on their credits, and we all have got some histories to tell or some stories to tell, but cleaning up your credit is a very important thing in, in business. Um, the first part of your question again was? When you grow. When you grow. You know, that's, a, that's another good question. It, it depends on what the value of your money is. For example, if we could, we could use cash for a new concept or to add people or to build a new restaurant, or we can borrow money. It just depends. If, if interest rates are at 5 6%, and I know that we can get a, a better ROI uh, putting that money to use, then we'll borrow it. So when we, when we went international, uh, we, we made a major cash investment uh, of probably about $750,000 at that time to launch our international play. We brought in people, we made legal investments and things like that. So that was a, a one-time kind of, let's, let's do this, and that was internal. So. Okay, one more question. All right, you wanted it bad right there. All right. All right, better be good as right. Right. Sure. Well, I, that, that's a, a valid statement or question. Um, we've we struggled to run our own restaurants and be a franchise company. So about five years ago, we started to sell off some company restaurants, and now we only operate four company-owned restaurants because our entire focus is about the franchising side of it, providing that support, the systems, all the resources to that. Um, some systems have been able to do both. You know, some can operate company-owned stores and franchise. Uh, I mean, Chick-fil-A is probably one of the most successful restaurant brands um, in the world right now, and it's hard to argue with their success. And ultimately, they are a privately held company, and they can do whatever they want. So, well, I really want to thank you. Uh, i got to tell you uh, real quick, the people, like the professors and the people I've met at Clayton State uh, are exceptional people. I mean, to have this many of your... Um, professor, professors and people come out to, to kind of support you. 
um, and to, to hear me speak is really amazing. So I, I cannot thank you enough for this opportunity and um, I wish you all the best. Well, thank you, Matt, for, for this truly inspiring and interesting talk, right? We learned a lot. This is a first-hand impression. You can get it from a textbook. On behalf of the College of Business and the University, I would like to present this memento to Matt Friedman, which says in appreciation of your commitment, time, and willingness in sharing your knowledge and expertise with the students, faculty, and staff at Leighton State University. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I would like to thank Spivey Hall for making this wonderful facility available to us this evening. I would like to thank John Mascaritolo for, for organizing this event and making it work. <laughs> I would like to thank Professor Lou Jordan, who actually met Matt Friedman and got him here. <laughs> and of course, thanks to everyone for coming today and, and making this event a success. Thank you very much. Thank you.